Joe Marchese, who I've known for a long time, he went from you know, digital ad tech entrepreneur to running ad sales at one of the largest media companies, uh, Fox. He's a contrarian and some would say enlightened approach uh, to advertising that's inspired and frightened uh, executives in big media. Never one of accused, no one has ever accused Joe of not sort of leaning into the future as he sort of fashions a different consumer ad experiences and pursues different business models. Here to moderate a discussion is a man who needs absolutely no introduction, Michael Casson. Welcome to the stage, Joe Marchese. Do I count as still having my wallet open? <laughs> Thank you, Terry. So, Joe, um, I think yesterday you were somebody who had their wallet open. What's that? I think you were somebody who had their wallet open yesterday. How's that? You were receiving orders from all the advertisers. You oh, had your, yeah. You had your wallet open. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's the other way around, though. That's, that's it. It's coming inbound. There you go. Well, you know, you've got to open it to put money in, so that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. So, Joe, um, I had some prepared remarks, but uh, uh, after watching you yesterday, um, speaking from, you know, You're talking about the, the dancing, right? Yeah, okay. and 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 I do have to tell those of you who didn't get a chance to uh, experience uh, the Fox upfront. Joe was a reluctant non-dancer on the stage. It was it was quite the scene uh, where he was being uh, very uh, uh, aggressively ag aggressively told to dance in front of three thousand people when you're not really prepared to do anything close to that. You, the video is going to come out. It's, uh, some of the reporters have it, so don't worry. I'll be embarrassed plenty later. But we'll move on to advertising stuff. Let's move on to advertising. Yeah. But Joe, um, yesterday you announced something officially uh, known as JAZZ, uh, yeah. and, and Just A to Z right. is what I think the acronym is, yeah. is for. Um, could we, excuse sure. that I couldn't help, but can we riff on that for a minute? Can you? Sure. Can you talk about what jazz is and, and, so, and the, the, the idea behind it? Yeah, so, uh, so, so jazz stands for just the A and Z position. So the two positions in an ad pod, A position being the one right before the content, or right at the content, and Z position is the last position before the content starts. Um, the whole theme that we believe is the closer an ad is to content, the more effective the ad is because the more likely you have attention. So I've kind of been on the, the riff, and I'm a huge fan of uh, Moat and, and what they've, they've been doing. Um, but if you scored every ad impression for likelihood of attention, the closer you get it to the content, the better. Last year we did a lot with six second ads inside of uh, sports content. We think nearly perfect attention transfer. There's almost no chance this, that's been muted. There's almost no chance you've left the room. Even an out of home in bars, like the six second ad in content was being delivered. So we had this concept that if we could move all advertising to just the A and Z position, and then also get rid of the other ads in the middle. So really, we're even experimenting with putting a promo between the two ads, so that basically RIP surrounds all advertisement, right? Like if you put a 10 or 15 promo, like we would create a new product. See, what the, what the ad market has done historically is uh, supply goes down by X, so price should go up by Y, or, or X exactly, inversely. Um, but the market doesn't bear that because uh, the market won't bear that because agencies are compensated by price savings from clients, and it's no one's fault. It's not. That, by the way, people hear this and they think I blame agencies. No, clients. Like this is a systematic thing. So what happens is they say, well, now we can't buy it. So how do you keep the price from going up X? Well, you you put money into a mythical long tail or bullshit digital uh, properties, and then therefore that depresses pricing so that the market doesn't correct. Now, what you could do, though, is say, so what, what did TV do? Saying, well, we need to take that $100 million from you, Advertiser X. So what we're going to do is put six ads in a pod, seven ads in a pod, nine ads in a pod, 10 ads. You know some pods have like 12 ads in them. We knew that, that there was decreasing effectiveness and price was going up, but price wasn't going up by what it should have gone up by. And that was the deal we all made with each other. And that was fine when it's a two-party negotiation, TV networks and uh, the advertiser, right? But when it's a three-party negotiation, TV networks, advertiser, and viewer, who can now go buy Netflix or go buy ad free for five bucks, you're kind of screwed. So, so what we said is, okay, let's go, let's go in reverse. Rather than saying, we won't, the market price of our ads won't go up by what everyone else says the market price will go up by, our market price will be higher, but instead, we will actually lower the ad load and make the ads more effective. So you know the constant complaint, why are we paying more for less, which I never understood because CPM stands for cost per thousand, so I'm not really sure it's your, you're paying more per thousand. But, uh, what we said was, this will be the first time you're paying more for more. 
Like, we'll actually make a better product. Well, Joe, you know, we've, we've had this conversation in the industry for quite some time around addressable advertising and whether or not there's a belief that, that marketers would pay a premium for, um, for addressable advertising. Mm -hmm. I've always taken a position personally and from a media link perspective that it's not a premium if I can actually reach the person I want to reach in an addressable way, I'm paying fair value. I mean, what you're saying is essentially the same thing. The price elasticity aside, I'm going to give you a better result. Right. And, and you know, you also, and I don't want to not get there, you also talked about performance right. pricing yesterday, right. which I think is a, something to share with the audience. But talk about that price for a moment. So let's talk price first, and then, and then you, know I, you know I love hating attribution. Um, but the, the, the problem with uh, uh, the price elasticity is that um, let's say you pay a $30 CPM right now, and you know one in 10 people that you're reaching is a consumer. So you're effectively paying a $300 CPM for the person that you were reaching before. But the market has no mechanism to go to a $250 CPM if you're reaching just the people you want in television, because that will just look like you just got crushed on your rate of change from year over year. So since the market has no mechanism to do it, it just doesn't happen, period. Now, take that a step further. I actually believe there's a myth in the ability to over-targeting. So let's say you think only one in 10 consumers needs to see the ad for the new Ford truck, right? Because only one in 10 consumers is a truck driver. The problem is the people who need to know what a Ford truck is, is not just the person who drives it, but it's the person who drives its boyfriend, girlfriend, mother, neighbor, parents, when you drive home with it. Like brands are built in society and their profit margin is based on how much people trust them, how much they desire the brand, right? And in order to be a brand, more than just the person who owns it. What the platforms have convinced the world is, is that attribution or the sale is all that matters, which at some point means margins will be zero. And, and like, TV isn't for that. Like. Well, we've always believed that it's not just when the sale is occurring, it's the aspirational buyer you want to hit. It's, yeah. it's that person. And, and someone you know, who we've always used bought. it not with Ford trucks, not that that's not an aspiration for many folks, but we've used it with luxury automobiles and saying the first time you advertise a Mercedes to somebody shouldn't be when they can afford it. It should be when they're fantasizing yep. about it. I mean, exactly. So and, that's, and, that's, and that goes to the second point you're talking about, which is the attribution side, which is the, the absolute lie of ROI tracking is just astounding. I mean, like the, 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 the belief that half a visible ad for even, or even a 30 second spot can be directly tied to someone going out and buying an $18,000 automobile is so bafflingly stupid that like I can't, I, I can't, I can't actually put it together. Like, like the decision is made over many, even like, like even buying a pair of Nikes, like isn't like, if you think that, oh, I can find the four points that the person got to Nike, are you gonna find the five exposures for Adidas that, that didn't lead to a purchase and call that negative attribution? Like I, I, it, it, is, it is so insane to me. So Joe, I wanna go back to what you said is now a tripartite agreement, which is the, 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 the agency, the publisher, and the consumer. Mm -hmm. I would submit to you it's a four part uh, negotiation today. I think it's the agency, it's the publisher, it's the consumer, and it's the brand themselves. Mm -hmm. Your business has changed dramatically, and much of it new. But you know, you're you're uh, you know just finishing a year in this role. The marketer themselves has a louder voice in the negotiation now. Whether it's exactly about price or everything else, you're dealing with the marketers directly more than people in your position have historically done. Does that change that negotiation from your perspective? Like you said, I've only been doing it a year. How would I know? Um, but I will say, I, I don't. I don't know that that's necessary. They wouldn't know the yeah. difference. We could fake it here. Yeah. I, look, I, I would say that the uh, yes, we have a lot of interactions with the client, but no, the volume of dollars are still done with agencies. So yes, like I would say, most of my interactions with agency or with clients and brands is like a permission tour, trying to get permission for their agencies to buy differently, because the agencies aren't dumb either. They're just stuck in the middle of hey. You know, my favorite, like one of these, one of these other sayings that is just so hilarious is cost savings. So they're like, I need you to get me last year's plan at 20% less. Did people's time become worth less this year? Right? Because you're supposed to be buying people's time. So where is that savings supposed to come from? Like I, I like, like you mathematically can't figure out if more hours were added to the day. More ad viewing wasn't added to the day. Do you think like in Q4 every year people watch more ads than they watch the rest of the year? But yet there's more ad impressions in Q4. It's, it's a very bizarre, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a crazy thing. But the system invites it, and it's not, it's not any one player. So things like Jazz Pods, things like Six Seconds, is more about saying, OK, we're just going to set up new products that will actually work better. The problem is it's going to be a very long burn. The ROI is going to come over you know, year plus. So Joe, talk about the Six Second Spots. You, you got a lot of 
um, great press, but a lot of great uh, um, results, mm -hmm. not just press, yep. around the six second spots with T-Mobile mm -hmm. uh, last year in the World Series. Yep. Who, where, who owned the creative on that? Uh, they owned, I mean, they own, uh, the brand always owns a creative. No, I right? mean but in like, terms of the we creation. Did, we did help edit some of them down. And I would say that's a short-term thing. I think that you know one of the boons for advertising agencies coming is that if there's all these new ad formats, there's gonna be a lot more creative jobs out there um, because they don't scale very well and people don't like the platforms don't like them because you know they don't, oh they require human beings so that seems terrible. So the so like I think that it's a big upside for the agencies to say okay we're gonna have a whole new set of formats so let's actually make let's actually make all sorts of new creative. Have you have you seen any pushback? from the agencies because what you just said points up a fact to me. I had somebody years ago, Frank Lowe, Sir Frank Lowe, who was one of the legends in advertising, complained that he thought the only way to tell a, a commercial message story was in a print ad. Mm -hmm. He thought, we talked about years ago, a 10 second spot, he thought that was blasphemy. He thought even a 60 second spot wasn't enough to tell <laughs> yeah. a story. And so from a, a traditional ad agency perspective, mm -hmm. we see this in radio all the time. Nobody wants to do radio creative because it's not as sexy. Right. Are you think there's gonna be a call for people to wanna yeah. I mean, have creative expression in six seconds? Yeah, I mean, like if you look at, you look at like Instagram stories or the way people communicate through short videos, makes perfect sense. I also think that the, the point is we, we lost the track with every brand thinking it needs to be in the content business. Like, I maybe like every brand of paper towels doesn't need a 30 minute telenovela that makes you cry, like to tell you that these pick up, like, like I don't know how quickly Bounty could tell me that it's the quicker picker upper and here's what it costs and here's where to buy it, right? Like that's six seconds. I think actually part of the problem has been since time is what people bought, time is what people filled. You know, the, the hilarity of the six second ads was the first pushback was, we're not gonna pay for six seconds what we used to pay for 15 seconds, right? But that's like my parents saying, I'm not gonna pay 600 square feet in Manhattan what I paid 1,500 square feet in Albany for. I'm like, cool, stay in Albany. Like, it's like, it's like, 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 I, like, like, like the fact that we don't dimensionalize media the way, like just A and Z positions, same thing. It's different real estate. So like, like it's different, like we've only dimensionalized media in time. We've never dimensionalized it in real estate in the same way. And it's kind of led to the cesspool of the internet, like being like, okay, impressions don't matter. You know, the, this was the, the, the joke I did at the, the upfront yesterday was we flashed all the hotel logos on the thing. And I said, I just want attribution credit for anyone here staying at a hotel. Uh, and that was all I had time for yesterday. But if I was gonna unpack that, here's the lie and here's how it's happening. If I have the best data in the world that says I know who's going to stay in a hotel tonight, and then I expose that group who I think is definitely going to stay in a hotel tonight to every hotel brand, and then lo and behold, that group beats whatever control group that the hotel brand can come up with because their data isn't as good as the person who's serving the ad. Wow, control exposed. Yep, I drove sales. Correlation without causation. Like that's basically what's been happening in the industry. So, Joe. Sorry for anyone who's an attribution. You. You um, you made a call. Oh, actually, I guess I'm not so sorry. You guys are going to do great because there's no way we're unwinding this in the short term. There you go. Um, <laughs> the, and the night is young. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's still hope. Um, Joe, By the way, these are Tuscan Raiders for whoever's wondering. That's Obi Wan. They, they don't match. And no, there's no Disney theme that has anything to do with it. It's just. By the way, if you were wearing those yesterday, I would not blame you for not dancing. Just mm -hmm. to be clear. Hey, easy. Um, but Joe, let, let let me ask you a question. And 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 you just talked about it in terms of you know, attribution on the one hand. The, the buzz so far, we're two days in, it's Tuesday. Uh -huh. I've sat through Fox and NBC and part of Disney and, yeah. and uh, Univision, et cetera. Brand safety, mm -hmm. we talked about it. Mm -hmm. It's out there, mm -hmm. you know, at NBC, Linda's mm -hmm. position. And I know someone wrote a headline, it's you versus Linda. Yeah, I thought that was today. interesting. You know? I think Linda, Linda said- Linda Yaccarino. I, I got the quote. So, uh, some reporter got it for me. So I'm gonna make, I'll make some news here for everyone. The quote was, so she was a spoof asked, who's your biggest competitor? And she said, you know, if you ask Marchese, he'd say him, but it's really, it's really that bitch pedal princess 98 and flywheel. Um, so do, I just wanna make a little bit of news here today, guys. I'm pedal princess 98. It's my, <laughs> it is my handle at flywheel. I've got the, I've got the record. No, um, I, I think it is, it's totally overstated. The vision that was, in spandex is, I know. is well, killing me. Between that and my socks, you really hate my outfits. <laughs> um, the the I think it's way overblown. Like actually, we we're totally aligned on kind of the difference between the requirements for brand safety, the like like what needs to get focused on. I think I think they took out of not out of context, but they like Linda talked about being in the results business. 
Um, and it just so happened that that afternoon, uh, I had said something, but very specific to attribution, that I do not know how any brand, any publisher can promise sales outcomes to any brand. It does not seem possible. And then also work with their competitors. Like, I can't work with Toyota and say, I'm gonna help you sell trucks and then go walk into Ford's offices. I can tell Toyota, I can give you a great place to sell your trucks, but if Ford has a better price or a better product or a better creative, like, they can still win. Like, that's, that, I, I just can't fathom how you can be in the business of your customer unless you're only gonna be in one per vertical. So, yeah, but I'm not smart enough to figure it out. So, so Joe, um, we talked about brand safety for a moment. There's a lot of focus, particularly at Fox, on sports. Um, is that, the counter, is that the counterpunch to brand safety? Counterpunch in what way? Well, I mean, you know it's going to be safe. Yeah. Well, look, I think all of, all of what we have in TV, you know it's going to be safe. I, I've, I've watched someone try to argue, well, look, there's always been brand safety problems. You know, some of our brands didn't want to be next to, you know, NYPD Blue the first time they showed a man's ass or something. And I was like, are we really comparing that to like ISIS videos? Like, I mean, like let's 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 have some let's have something let's have a conversation about what we're talking about with brand safety. So you always knew professionally produced content was going to be safe because there's FCC laws. There's like there, there's very little chance the Russian government is funding the shows. Although if you saw the Americans, like you know, there's you know that that, uh, that I don't spoil it if you've seen the end. Um, so so I think long form storytelling has always been the counterpunch. Like brands are a collection of stories. And so being embedded in the better stories has always been the right thing to do. Um, it's just we lost the track. And I think the attribution thing is part of what pulled us off it because everyone's like, well, it's not brand safe, but I see sales results. Well, not really. I, I don't get how everyone gets a bunch of different attribution studies and their sales are still down, but all of the different attribution studies say a positive result. Like, does that, like, can, like, has anyone ever just totaled up, like, get to more clients, if they just totaled up all their attribution studies from all their different vendors and showed, like, a net plus 15 and their sales are down or minus five, like, like and, and then better, even worse yet, brand value, which is the thing that would be future money is down, like, like, something's not, the problem is it's very hard to beat a simple lie with a nuanced truth, and the simple lie is, I, I'm in the sales business with you, um, and my sales team hates me for, for doing this. Well, but I think there's some, something to be said for honesty in the sales process. It doesn't you mean matter. honest that they hate me? Uh, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> um, Joe, you are part of OpenAP, mm -hmm. which is a unique industry moment to get everybody, I think just about everybody now. You've got yourself, Viacom, NBC, Turner. Univision, Turner. Mm -hmm. Who am I leaving out? Well, there's a couple that aren't in there yet. That's it. That's it so far. So how's that working out? I mean, I know you took a, a, a whack at having that conversation in the spring. NBC did one last year where you're getting mm -hmm. kind of strange bedfellows together. Mm -hmm. You're strange bedfellows. You're mm -hmm. competing all the time. Yeah. There's well, that's why, that's why I thought the headline was overblown because, like, actually very aligned. I think TV as a long-form storytelling, including sports, so to your brand safety question, is, is long-form viewing, right, that, that behavior of someone consuming information in a way that a story is told to them. That should be a platform. TV should be a platform. The way Facebook is a platform or Google is a platform. Search is a platform. I don't even call Google because YouTube TV is TV, right? So search is a platform. Uh, the feed is a platform. It's a scary one, but it's a platform. Um, long form storytelling should be a platform. In order to be a platform, you have to be able to easily buy it. In order to easily buy it, you have to have unified data and, and, and standardized formats. So OpenAP is really nothing more than an industry group that's kind of like has is building the pipe so that it can be standardized format, standardized data. So, so w when when you talk about the group on the one hand, I understand that. When you talk about formats on the other hand, do you see the group coming together on formats? Do you see the group coming together on that? Sure. A and B. You talked about platform. Mm -hmm. There's a whole school of thought that thinks uh, the people who are calling themselves platforms, and I don't know if you were using the term in that way, yep. but the group that are call, calling themselves platforms are actually media companies, yeah. not platforms. Yeah. What do you consider Fox to be? Oh, well, the, Media company or platform? Well, the answer is, the answer is both, right? If, if we could take zero responsibility for what was on our air, it would be a platform, right? Like, like, like if we could say, if we could say, That's look, my point. look, Empire, look, Empire might have been a bit racy this week, but we didn't do it. We just gave a platform to the director. <laughs> so wait, wait, then we're a platform. If you decide what goes on your air, if you decide what shows up in the feed, you're a media company, right? And 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 you know, 
But therein, li therein lies the question as oh. to whether or not the promise of democratization that the internet posed to everybody creates situation where it is a platform versus a media company who does have a green light. No, I mean, no, it has, to, it has to end up as a media company because as a platform, you'd have perfect parity in the ability for, to find something. I don't have perfect parity in the ability to find something, right? Like, results have to be altered based on, based on something. I, whether you call it an algorithm or not, like, what if, a, what if we just said, vote for what you want to see at 10 o'clock, and even if it was racy, we just say, but people voted on it, the algorithm decided, we didn't decide. So therefore, it's no longer, like, at some point, someone takes responsibility somewhere. Well, and, but no, but uh, listen, we're, we're on all fours on that. I, I, I violently agree with you, but you use the expression platform. Well, but I, 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 I use it differently. Yeah, I would use it differently. Not in the anyone can put anything they want on the air. Like, I actually mean platform is in a unified set of uh, rules. Like, you know, like, like first of all, TV, is a, TV was a platform until it started breaking out into all, everything else because TV is a platform. The single currency is, was... Nielsen, right? Um, and I say that in that, like, like people can have all the complaints they want about Nielsen. Uh, at least there's not like warehouses racking off fake impressions someplace. Like, like, like it's 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 the same thing everyone else has. So you have a currency to trade on. As soon as that started to break down in the non-linear sense, where digital had one set of rules and we had one, and then all of a sudden, then it's almost like we TV was a platform historically, and now it's kind of begun to fragment into little custom shops where everyone has their own. OpenAP is an attempt to make TV a platform again in terms of relative to that, not right. relative to the difference between right. media company and yes. platform. That was what I was yes. trying to get yep. to because it's an unfair advantage well, if well, one has the ability to uh, not take responsibility for what's well, on their actually, ear or on their. You know, it's feet. funny. It's funny you say that because now that I think about it, and I've, I've never thought about it this way before. No, I want OpenAP to be an actual platform in the way that it is. So, see, OpenAP isn't a media company, right? There are media companies who are members of it, but OpenAP actually is a platform in that it doesn't actually get to decide what goes on. The media companies who who air it ends up on has to own that, right? The platform should be something that is universally scalable. That should be there. So, actually, as you ask that line of questioning, thanks. That was helpful. But there you go. I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to deliver some value to you up here, <laughs> Joe. Um, we're going to hear a lot of pundits say uh, how this upfront's going to turn out. Yep. Uh, across the board, what's your take? You, you think we have an up uh, uh, an up upfront or I mean, a flat my, up front? I mean, obviously, my answer is going to be it's going to be way way up and mostly for Fox. Good. That's the right yep. answer. Sure. But but taking Fox out of that equation. Yeah, look, I, I think what will happen is exactly what I've said has been happening, which is the price should actually be going up way more than it should, but because of the system of, of how people are compensated and value is extracted in the, in the chain, it can't go up as much as it naturally should for higher quality. So money will flow to lower quality to kind of keep the market price down a little bit, but it'll be up, it'll be up significantly from, from where it was. Is it up as much as it actually should be? No. I think the creation of new products and, and new targeting and people who are, have permission to buy into new products, uh, like any broken currency market, and I've said this before, but like any broken currency market, people can get really rich if they can figure out what's broken about the market. Like where are the inefficiencies? They can start arbitraging. And I think that like in this world of, of kind of spoofed attribution, if you will, there's probably a lot of money to be made, but it's, it's not made next quarter. It's made you know, over the course of a year. And, and Joe, if you look at it through the lens of um, the marketer, mm -hmm. um, and if you look at it through the lens of the publisher, and now I'm talking about the media companies for a moment, do you think that the network television business has been as strong as it has been over the last couple of years? Again, with sometimes lower viewership, whatever, whatever right. the dynamic is, pay more for less, right. all the things you said. Right. Do you think that the television and cable broadcast universe has been a, I mean, I think the answer is yes. I'm, uh, I'm leading the well, way. Well, then I'll just go with has that. Has been a beneficiary of the Cambridge Analytica and the brand safety no. issues. Well, is that artificially supporting prices in television? No, I think that's art I mean, it's artificially depressing because you think that like money can flow there when it really can't. There shouldn't be. The, the long tail is a myth marketers tell themselves that they can believe that there's 10,000 mommy blogs that have 500 users each. Like it's just not true. Like the, the like that is like that's that's been it's been manufactured. Uh, I I think that the um, the problem with the more for less statement in general is. Again, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm just making up, I'm using Ford and Toyota because they're top of mind because, you know, we do a lot of automotive and sports. But 
like, you know, Ford shows a 20 frequency because Toyota shows an 18 frequency. There's no reason why, like, a three frequency versus two frequency, if delivery was guaranteed, wouldn't work exactly the same. And so when you say, that means really what you're looking at is share of delivery. So when the impressions go down, but the reach is still pretty much the whole US, if the impressions go down, the volume just goes, or the value just goes up proportionally. Because like your same exact 30 second spot is now a greater share of time of people watching ads because people watch less ads. So that's, I mean, it's, a, it's hard to think of that way, but share is actually as important. And I think we've got a couple of minutes left, and I know we weren't necessarily planning on it, but do we yeah, have a question tell. or two? Great. Well, in that case, we're uh, down to 10 seconds. So I'm going to say thank you. Uh, and Joe, thank you for thank you. taking the time today. I know it's been a crazy week. Yep. And you want to dance off the stage? No, or do you want not at all. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>